Good morning, everyone. How's everyone feeling? Everyone awake? Got your coffee in you? I hope so, because I've got a lot of slides. We're going to crank through some data. Um, but I want to say, don't bother taking pictures. I'm happy to share the deck afterwards. But we've got a lot of stats for you and ideas that you should be thinking about related to the future of work. So just real quick, who we are, 8 Inc., we're an experienced design firm, basically. Probably haven't heard of us, but you probably know our work because our co-founders were approached by Steve Jobs 25 years ago to create a retail store concept for Apple. So we've been leveraging that type of experience design methodologies to do a lot of other things. You know, what we focus on is designing these human experiences and translating it into business outcomes. So the same things we do for people like Apple, we've just done for Maserati, but we also do it for offices. So we've done it recently for BM Tory in New York. And this is important because when we look at the future of work, human experiences are going to define it. But let's get to the return to the office, which is where we are today. And it's been a bit of a journey. If you go back to the pre-pandemic days, three quarters of us were working in the office and only about 22% hybrid. But now when you look at the current state, just under a third of us are back in the office and about 60% are working hybrid. But this is where we are today. What we forecast for 2023 and what business leaders think is under 20% of us are going to be full-time in the office next year. Now, we've gone through a lot of transformation to get this far. I mean, just think about the business operational and digital transformation that we've gone through. And it's pretty impressive, but it also worries me a bit because we're not very good at transformation. If you think about it, according to McKinsey and BCG, 70% of transformations fail. And just last year, there was a survey of 1,000 global companies, and they found out that 84% of HR transformations are failing. And it's actually getting a little bit better because five years ago, our Bain that actually said 95% of digital transformations fail. So the problem we face is, what does this mean for a return to the office? We've delivered transformation, but have we delivered it well? And is it working? And is it ready to go forward? So that's what we're going to talk about today and the challenge we face, because I honestly think we're making a bit of a mistake right now, because we're coming back with these strategies. And we're saying, I want to go back to work real quick, and then we implement our tactics. But very few companies actually focus on the human outcomes first. So what human outcomes do you want to drive when you deliver your strategy? And let me explain this a little bit further with relation to the return to office. So we know right now that 62% of companies want to implement a hybrid work strategy. And we also know in knowledge worker firms, that's up at 90%. So this is your strategies. And the tactics aren't surprising. We know we need to reconfigure or resize or relocate our offices to account for the trends that we're going through. But then we also want to implement all these different amenities that our employees want, although we're not doing that great of a job of it just yet. But this is just the strategy and the tactics. And if you do that, it doesn't guarantee success. And the reason it doesn't is we haven't addressed the human impact of the pandemic yet. And this is what's really worrying me, because it's great that we're all coming back to work, but we're sort of ignoring some of the bigger stats that are out there. Only 21% of people say they're engaged at work. 44% say they experience stress a lot in the previous day. 75% struggle to incorporate well-being habits into their daily routine. 62% think managers don't support healthy working habits. 73% of parents said they felt burned out in the past three months, and 58% are rethinking their work-life balance. So we've just pushed these people back into the office without a clear strategy of what we want them to do yet. And this is stats, and you can just ignore them saying, oh, it's just stats, but it's not. These are our friends, and these are our colleagues, and what they're saying is, I'm not engaged, I'm stressed, my well-being has been impacted, I don't feel supported, I'm burned out, and I'm rethinking my future. So this is what we need to think about when we bring people back into the office. And ignoring these human outcomes has led to everybody's favorite buzzword, the great resignation. And the bad news is it's actually getting worse. And what we see right now is if you look at globally, 50% of people say they're extremely likely to switch jobs in the next 12 months. Now you break that down by the younger generation, it gets up even higher. But what's very worrying is when you go to the pandemic hires, the people we attempted to onboard during the pandemic, that's at over 60% in Asia. Now think about the costs you're going to have to incur to replace these people and the loss in productivity and efficiency within your businesses. And this is all worse in Asia Pacific because if you look at just the next three to six months of people who say they're at least somewhat likely, globally it's at 40%, Australia's right around the average, 
but Singapore's at nearly 50%, and India's at nearly two thirds. And people like thinking that it's, oh, just these younger generations, they just don't wanna work. This is my favorite stat that's come out recently from Deloitte. They surveyed the C-suite and found that 70% of the C-suite are seriously considering quitting for a job that gives them a better work-life balance. And I'm lucky enough to know a lot of people in the C-suite, most of them are, and that's anecdotal, but I can see this happening going forward. And the problem is we have this disconnect right now. See, we think that people are leaving because they're looking for a better job or they're in poor health or it's inadequate compensation. But when you ask the people who are leaving these jobs what they wanted and why they've left, they want to feel valued by their organization. They want to feel valued by their manager and they want a sense of belonging. So these are human outcomes that we are not delivering right now in our offices. So it's easy to sit there and just say, oh, they just wanted more money. That's not the case. People want something that means more than just money in the work that they do. So they're also having this great rethink, which is another worrying stat. McKinsey did a survey from April 2020 to April 2022. So peak pandemic time. For every 100 people who quit their jobs during that period, 17 never returned to the workforce. So that's a worry. We just lost 17% right there. 48 switched industries, which means only 35 returned to work in the same industry. And this is creating a massive talent shortage, and it's getting harder and harder to bring in talent to your companies right now. And this global talent shortage, this isn't anecdotal. This has been tracked for years by Manpower. They survey 40,000 companies, and it's at 75% of the companies are finding it difficult to source talent right now. And again, this is worse in Asia because all the countries they surveyed in Asia are above it except for Japan, and Singapore's at 84% and Taiwan's at 88%. So we have a lot of work to do around this, and we should not be oversimplifying the return to work. It's a complex beast, and everyone just wants to know, well, how many days do I send somebody back to the office? There is no right answer. It's very complicated. There's so many dependencies we need to think about. I saw this stat recently that in London, well, people are going to the office at an average of 1.5 days a week, and I was shocked. Until I went down farther and found out that's actually ahead of the global average of 1.4 days a week. But then you look what happened in Singapore when we opened up. During the first month, 74% of us were going to the office on most states. But then you go to somewhere like Hong Kong, and 89% prefer to work mostly or entirely from home. So this isn't a simple thing where we can just say, well, let's go three days a week in the office, and that's our plan. It's not that easy. We need to start tailoring these things down by job profiles and looking about the preferences of where people want to work. Don't try and read the slide. There's too much information, but look at the top. What we have up here are the countries in Asia, Asia Pacific, that most want to work in the office. And it's across Indonesia, India, New Zealand, and Australia. So those countries probably have a little bit better of a work-life balance. But look at the bottom ones. It's all the Northeast Asian countries. It's Korea, China, Hong Kong, Taiwan, Japan. The countries that have a bit of a bullying culture in the workforce, China with its 996, people don't want to go back to the office because they don't want to deal with that. But even that's oversimplifying it because there's so many other dependencies you need to think about. The country that wants to go back to work the most in the world is the Netherlands. And how many people have lived or worked in the Netherlands before? Anyone? Okay. So the work-life balance in Holland is better than anywhere else. I used to work in banking in Chicago. I did the typical 80-hour weeks, no life, two weeks holiday a year. I moved to banking in the Netherlands. I got seven weeks holiday, and they turned the lights off in the building at eight o'clock. I mean, if, you, if I left before eight in Chicago, I was at risk of being fired. So they're coming back because they've got the right culture for it. But then there's also the types of work you do. Is it synchronous work where you need to work as a team and generate ideas together? Or is it asynchronous where you're just more of a task-based one and you can work on your own? But even that's too simple because in our organization, if we're doing a visioning session, we bring in a bunch of people from multiple disciplines to try and brainstorm together. But then later on in that project, they might become much more asynchronous and just work on tests. So we need to start adapting things around this. We also have age gaps and age differences. In China, when they talked about people who have a preference to work fully remote, the younger generation, only 3.4% want to. They'd rather go into the office for some reason because of the 996, but the baby boomers don't want to go back to the office anymore. And then, of course, you've got the cost issue. We tend to think that in London, people don't want to go back to work because they just don't want to go back to work. Think about this in London. The average commuter spends 23 days commuting. That's 23 full days commuting. The average cost of that is $13,250. 
and that's 21% of the average salary. Now, that's part of it, but think about this. The pound's tanking, inflation's going through the roof since this report came out, and energy costs are going to go up massively. It's a financial burden for them to go to the office right now, so people aren't doing it. So this is what we need to consider when you start looking at your offices around the region or around the world. But then we have to start addressing the challenges as well. We know that these hybrid workers feel lonelier and have fewer relationships, and even management recognizes. 43% of them say that relationship building is hybrid work's greatest challenge. Then we have to worry about the onboarding, which I told you before, people who were onboarded during the pandemic are most likely to leave right now. 69% of Asia's business leaders are concerned that new hires aren't getting much support. I don't know how many of you were onboarded during the pandemic, but everyone I know who has been has thought about leaving already because they've never been fully integrated yet. So how are we gonna get over this going forward? And then of course, we got the productivity challenge. 62% of the leaders think that hybrid work has negatively impacted productivity. And this is great because now we've come up with these great new technical solutions to do employee monitoring. And in some countries, it's 50 to 60% of the companies are tracking your laptop to make sure you work from nine to six. And that's horrible. We have to stop doing these things because it's bad for business. It's bad for your employees. There's no trust built. So the question is, what do you do? Well, first of all, here's a tip. Acknowledge that this is a journey. This is not the new normal. This is abnormal. This is not fun. We're in a transitional phase. We're going to have to learn and continue to move on on this. And we also need to think about a new approach for hybrid work. And it's kind of a blue pill, red pill type of an example. So right now, we're in this mentality that we had from pre-pandemic days, where everything's hours-based. I need to know that you're working from 9 to 6, so I'm going to stick software on your laptop so I can prove that you're working there. Because as we know, nobody ever has a thought about work outside of those business hours or on weekends. That's not the right approach. We need to transition to make our jobs more outcomes-based. This is where you start designing the things that they have to deliver into the job profiles and gives them the flexibility. And we have to do this because the reality is 78% want flexibility of where they work, 95% want flexibility of when they work. So we need to change our cultures to adapt for this with hybrid work. Next thing, start the dialogue. We need to start talking to our employees about what's going on. We have to start asking about the experience they're having, but then help them understand that we know the pandemic was difficult for them. We have to start showing empathy. We should be talking to them and creating sort of groups to work together to evaluate what we should be doing with our return to work initiatives and office layouts and generating new ideas about how we can better design job profiles. And most importantly, start measuring your employee net promoter scores. This is something we're actually doing internally right now because I'm very concerned because I read way, way, way too many reports on this that everyone's going to leave. So I want to make sure that we're monitoring how happy people are and are they advocates of our company? And if not, what can we do to change that? Because hiring people right now in the pandemic is tough and you don't want to lose that productivity. Next one, start delivering the human outcomes and experiences that your employees want. And it's the first thing you have to do is start defining the outcomes. I know this sounds kind of simple, but what do you want your employees to feel? How do you want them to feel? And then look at it and be honest with yourself. Are you delivering those types of experiences that are going to make them have those human outcomes? You know, when we look at it, we know we want to be recognized and supported and engaged. Are we delivering that in our offices right now? Or have we just said, return to work and hope everything goes back to normal? And you have to start delivering enhanced experiences. Like what we do right now with our offices, we've got the basics. There's, if I talk to clients who have beautiful offices and they say, we've got everything. And then they do, we've even got these augmented offerings. We give them free drinks or free food. That's not making people want to come back to the office. We need to start building up these signature type experiences for our workers that make them want to come in. This isn't something where I can give you a list of five. This is dependent on your company, on your workforce, on their age, the profiles, type of work that they do. But you start designing things that make them want to come back to the office. You can't just force them there. You force them there, they will leave. The stats all support that, and I think we've all witnessed it over the past couple of years. But the goal is what we actually want to create in our offices and in our companies is irrational loyalty. And this is the same stuff that we've done with Apple that we also apply when we look at offices because every company is gonna have a set of values. And they start looking at the four different experience realms, the environments, product services, behaviors, and communications. How do you translate those values to reach your people and start building up this irrational loyalty? And this is where it's a challenge because this isn't easy. It's not something you just spend a day or so writing down. It's literally finding out what they want, talking to them, engaging them, and driving this conversation. So now, what's next? That's all the stats. Now we get to look at the role of technology because 
I like looking out at a longer term horizon. For the last 20 plus years, I've been pushing the adoption of emerging tech since the dot com era. Um, so I like looking at where technology is going to be, not today, but in three to five years from now. But before we talk about tech, I want to remind you of one very important thing. Technology exists to deliver human outcomes. The biggest problem we have with the tech industry today is we talk about tech to non-tech people. And if you explain technology to somebody who's non-technical, they don't care. And we don't explain to them what it actually means for them. Think about 5G. It's fast. So what? You can download a movie in seconds. So what? I stream. 4G works fine for streaming. So this is the mistake we always make in our industries. But what we're coming into is the era of digital twins. And this is actually quite exciting. And I'm sure since this is about real estate and offices, everybody's an expert on digital twins. So how many people, raise your hand if you could explain a digital twin to your colleagues and explain the human outcomes it'll deliver. I expect everybody from CBRE to raise their hand because you saw this a couple of weeks ago already. So they know how to do it. And I'm going to teach you guys how to do it. See, digital twins, we overcomplicate it. Everyone loves talking about it. No one knows what it means. And it should be really easy because it's not that complicated because digital twins deliver human outcomes. Okay, so no one knows what a digital twin is. How many people know what it's like to sit in traffic? Okay, the people who haven't raised your hand, I wanna know where you live, that you don't sit in traffic. All right, so I'm gonna explain digital twins to you through traffic, but if I wanna explain the human outcomes, I need a human. So I've picked this guy, Mr. Angry Road Rage Guy, and he hates sitting in traffic and he's stuck in traffic and he just wants to go home. Problem is, he's not going anywhere quick. He's sitting there in the middle of it. He's getting frustrated and getting more and more angry. And he looks around and he sees all these buses. Now, all those buses have sensors on them right now. And those sensors are communicating back to the bus company that I'm stuck in traffic. But they don't know why. Is it been an accident or is it just traffic? But he can also see all these taxis around. And those taxis are sending back data to the taxi company. And it's the same thing. The taxi companies knows they're stuck, but no one knows why. But then he also sees all these CCTV cameras around there. And they can see what's going on. They know there's traffic, but they know it's just normal traffic because they don't see an accident. Now, what if you took all this data that exists over here, over here, and over here, and put it into one place? Then you have all that data together, and then you could just overlay it on a map of the city. And that's pretty cool because then you can actually see what's going on in real time. Now, this isn't rocket science. You all use Google Maps. You can see where traffic is. That's all we're talking about doing. But we take it to the next level because what if I go to the city and say, I've got this data. Let me go control the streetlights. Because if I can do that, I can eliminate traffic. And that's cool, but it's not efficient because that's just me doing it. So why don't we use artificial intelligence to learn how to look at the data that's out there and automatically reprogram the lights? So that's what we're headed towards. That's basically a digital twin. Now, basically what we're looking at is Mr. Angry Road Rage Guy. What if I walked up to him and I said, listen, I've got this great new set of technologies out there. What we're going to do is aggregate disparate databases from multiple partners into one single platform. Then we're going to overlay it on a map. And then I'm going to use artificial intelligence and I'm going to visualize it. Mr. Angry Road Rage Guy is going to get even more angry. But what if I just walked up to him and said, listen, I've got some great new technology. They're going to automatically sort out these streetlights and get you home faster. Mr. Angry Road Rage Guy would become less angry. So what does this mean for your buildings? Creating your digital twin. The first phase is pretty easy, but first we have to define the human outcomes we want to get there. We want our employees to be informed, empowered, and recognized. Well, aggregating your building management systems, they almost all run on BACnet. This isn't rocket science. We can do that into a platform, and it starts delivering value. But what human outcomes does it deliver? Well, for our facilities manager, it allows him to reduce energy costs and consumption, save money by extending the useful life of assets, and help achieve carbon reduction targets. So that's some human outcomes that get delivered through this. But then again, that's the beginning of digital twins. It's the boring part. What's fun is I don't care about point solutions. I want everything going into a platform because we're capturing data about our people through spatial analytics and biometric access, employee tracking. We're tracking environmental data. We're tracking our assets, whether it's your security robots or your cleaning equipment. Put all of that into a platform of platforms and you can start delivering a lot more value because you can go to your CSO and talk about how do you monitor your carbon emissions and energy consumption. You can give her the data that she needs to implement this and reduce emissions, implement strategies to reduce emissions and report on the progress back internally so they can engage the employees on their sustainability journey and go externally as well. But you also have a workplace manager. 
What you know right now is your office designs aren't good for the next three years. You're going to have to redesign them as we learn what hybrid work is and how many people come back to the office. So this data will help her track meeting room and booking, uh, collaboration room booking spaces and desk utilization, evaluate the effectiveness of your current layout, and start reconfiguring it almost in real time to meet the different usage requirements that you have. And then we got the chief financial officer, the guy who doesn't care at all about tech. He's going to start caring about it real soon. Number one, he's going to be happy because using a digital twin will reduce CapEx and OpEx costs by driving asset efficiency. It allow them to report the progress to financial markets because they want to know how we're doing with our progress and sustainability. And it's going to help them minimize carbon taxes. People aren't talking about this stuff yet. The carbon taxes in Singapore are at $5, I think right now, per excess ton. It's going to go up to 50. So it's going to go up 10 to 15 fold by 2030. That's going to have a financial implication. People who don't care about tech today will when the bottom line gets hit. So digital twins can deliver a lot of value operationally, environmentally, workplace, financial, but they can only deliver value if we engage the different stakeholders. We have to start talking to people across the C-suite. People who normally don't talk together need to sit down in a room and figure out what data do I need? Because you can't deliver a digital twin unless you know what they actually need. So it's all about driving radical transparency and collaboration. So in conclusion, we've talked about a lot of topics today in a very short period of time, and I've given you tons of data, but I want you to remember that it's all about the people. If you want your return to office to be a success, show empathy, talk to your employees about the human impact of the pandemic. If you want to mitigate risk of the great resignation and the talent shortage that we're facing, design human outcomes that will help you attract and retain the best talent. If you want your hybrid work strategy to be successful, start designing your job profiles that allow them the flexibility to work where and when they want and make it much more deliverables-based versus hours-based. And finally, for driving innovation, don't talk about the tech. Talk about the outcomes that the tech can deliver. So it's all about people. And that's why we firmly believe the future of work is more human than you think. Thank you.